Good morning, or afternoon actually, and welcome to the Thought Leader Series webinar with Damon Kidney. It is our great pleasure to introduce you to Damon. Um, he's not only a great friend of our business, but he's one of Australia's leading uh, business journalists with The Australian, uh, and his career goes back to commencing with The Australian Financial Review. We've sent a book to everybody, um, and most people have got it already, and I think if you've read it, you'll see that Damon has a skill in being able to articulate personal stories amongst business people. In other words, he gets down to what makes people tick. Now, today is going to be a bit different than other webinars that we're hosted. I'm going to ask Damon questions, and this is going to get the discussion going. After about 20 minutes, I will be referring to the Q&A button and starting to bring some of your questions in and integrate that into the discussion as well with mine. And I envisage that hopefully this goes for just under an hour. Damon's latest book that many of you, as I mentioned before, have now uh, received is called The Inner Sanctum, The Secrets of Australia's Private Leaders, which is a collection of stories of these personal stories amongst many business leaders in our, in our country. And it follows on from his very successful book, The Price of Fortune, The Untold Story of Being James Packer. So welcome, Damon. Hi, Will. How are you? Very well, thank you. So could you just start by, just talk to us about your early career in journalism. Yeah, well, um, it's, it's funny, this, this book, um, <clears throat> it was completely, completely coincidental, but it coincides with 10 years of the Australian newspaper, which I just passed in July. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, that's that's sort of been my last ten years. But it's funny. My father um, is a journalist, or was. He's sort of retired now. Um, but a, a lot of you may know his name, Jeff Kipney, who was um, in the parliamentary press gallery in Canberra for many many years. Um, so I'm following in very famous footsteps. <clears throat> but it's funny that when I was going to university in Canberra um, and I studied law there. Um, Dad and I never talked about a journalistic career. <laughs> um, it was sort of, uh, I don't know, it was just never discussed. I'm not really sure why, but uh, that's just the way it was. And I sort of got into journalism through osmosis, through having um, four newspapers on the breakfast table each morning and every night watching four news services on the television. And you'd never watch the, the news till you saw the ABC. That's always the, the motto, I think, amongst ABC viewers, which my dad was one. Um, yeah, so I guess I, I just sort of developed an interest uh, um, yeah, through osmosis and then very luckily I got uh, a cadetship in Perth of all places with the Financial Review newspaper and that's where I started my journalistic career. Um, and over there it was quite funny because uh, Dad and Mum are both from Perth and everyone um, I would talk to, almost everyone, uh, the first question would be, uh, are you Jeff's son? which I was very proud of, but it uh, sort of grated on you after a while. And uh, eventually I, I remember in my third year there when I was still getting the question, I would say, so, or, yeah, what does that matter type thing. Um, but I was very lucky that the Fin Review invited me to Sydney um, in 1999. And um, the then editor, Glenn Burge, uh, put me on the company's desk, um, which I must say, when I first went there, I thought this is going to be as boring as... Uh, as anything, um, but that's funny because that's ended up where my career has taken me, and I, I think that also gave me separation from my father, to be honest, um, because he's never crossed into business journalism. And since that day I landed in Sydney, I've very rarely crossed into political journalism, so I sort of forged my own career there. Um, and I guess, yeah, the, the 16 years I spent at the Fin Review was, um, you know, very. Uh, Exciting, and I learned so many of the, the crafts of journalism there. Um, but I also, um, you know, developed that uh, opportunity to, to meet private wealthy people, if, to put it bluntly. Um, and one of those um, you've already mentioned, Will, was, was Mr Packer. Um, and I, I got to meet him during that time at the AFR. And we used to lunch together a few times a year and was always off the record, but... Um, to get an entree into that world was was really important, I think, um, and the network that that opened up. Um, 
And then when I joined the Australian, uh, yeah, I have really tried to develop this expertise of, uh, I call it uh, human journalism, um, where you really look behind the numbers, behind the, the, the EBITDA and the share prices to, to get behind the human beings that are our business leaders. And, uh, yeah, and that's really what this book is, is a celebration of. It's about the humanity of business. And uh, at the end of the day, we're all human beings. And how did this eventuate this sort of knack or skill for the personal views of business people? Like, you know, I noticed you know, the piece you've written on, you know, Mike Cannon Brooks, for instance, and we talked about it yesterday, you know, from down to answering the door, she's there, you know, in bare feet with the child. And then you, you, you take us down the passageway and then into the sitting room where you've got the Star Wars um, from the party, you know, all those, the characters, things around you. So how did you develop this, um, this knack or skill for that, those personal views? Um, well, I guess it sort of just it took time, but I, I guess you develop a name to some extent. Um, and as, you know, your um, people joining us here today would know, networks are very powerful and very important. Yeah. And once you develop a, a, an expertise or a name with, with influential people, it sort of flows through the network. So I think, um, in fact, it was actually my, my first... Um, big story like this at the Australian was the, the piece in the book with David Fox, which came out within only months of me joining the paper. Um, and I do re remember that the, I just got hundreds of messages to that story because it was so shocking, really, that um, a, a member of the Fox family would, would talk so openly and particularly about his own brother's uh, passing, sadly, um, after suicide. So, um, yeah, I guess that sort of set the agenda and um, sort of went from there. But I, I think it's it's interesting. There are some interviews you go to where it's uh, it's a given that it's going to be a tell-all. Um, yeah. You mentioned the Cannon Brooks one, and that's a great example. Um, they, I think, were really seeking to tell the world, um, I guess, through me, that they are normal people and... Um, Yes, they live in a very nice house in Centennial Park. And, uh, yes, they're, you know, technically on paper billionaires from the way Atlassian was going back then and still is. Yeah. But I think they wanted to, yeah, just tell a bit of the human story of, of who they are. And um, so that was really the brief for that day. And I remember when I walked through that door, as you um, mentioned, um, the, the step before that, I must say, when I turned up to the house and I just got, got out of a cab, it's, it's right opposite Centennial Park. There was not a lock on the gate. <laughs> there was no security, no guards, no locks, no nothing. I just strolled in. Um, and you walk on to the front lawn there and you can see, you know, there's a piece of play equipment which looked like it come from Bunnings. And as you said, Will, you know, Annie answered the door in bare feet with a child on her arm. And Mike followed... You know, a few seconds later, we in thongs, and then we sat in the front room there with blow up Star Wars dolls surrounding us from the party before. But before we actually sat down, they gave me a tour of the house um, and, you know, even the kids' bedrooms. And, and I saw, you know, Lego like my, my own son has, has today. And, it, and yeah, that took me out the backyard, see the pool and whatever. It was very. It was a real humanising experience. But there are other interviews where um, you don't necessarily have that brief when you go in. Um, sometimes you can just turn up and there's no real, real brief. Uh, people, um, you know, are happy to, to to do an interview about their their life, but you don't talk at all beforehand about what you're going to do. And I guess some of those are the exciting ones because they can take you anywhere. Um, particularly with people who have never talked before. Um, and I think about what's an example, the, the Perich family in that book, uh, which are, you know, the sort of um, milk kings, you might call them. Um, they, they had a, uh, they've got a big business called Freedom Foods. But I remember when I turned up there, like I'd, I'd never had met Tony Perich until I sat down with him. Uh, and it was sort of broken through his then CEO at the time. And it was just an open brief. And, um, and he was incredible because he was just so open about um, his family, his brother, 
you'll see in the, in the, in the book that he has this great anecdote about this pocketbook that he carries around with him that he writes sayings in. Um, and he took, I asked him to take it out, which he did, and he read me a few of the sayings. But all of that was just completely ad hoc. Um, yeah, so it can, it sort of can take a, a life of its own. There are some occasions, and I can tell you there's, some, there's a number in that book where there was a particular agenda that the person had to, um, you know, get some publicity around something. I remember with the piece on Andrew Meyer, uh, it was a very simple brief from his point of view. He was selling one of his shopping centres and he wanted some PR. Um, but I think what I probably have developed a name for and maybe people might be wary in the future is uh, when I do turn up knowing that there's an agenda, well, I often try to go beyond that agenda and, and well beyond it. And with Andrew that day, to his great credit, he was completely happy to talk about shopping centres for five minutes and himself for 50. Yeah. <laughs> it was the same with David Calvert-Jones. We actually met on a park bench outside the Botanic Gardens um, in South Yarra there. And he was just trying to flog this, um, a bit of PR on this, this app that he and his wife had developed. But um, knowing who he was and knowing uh, the, the Murdoch uh, relationship, Murdoch family relationship, I sort of delved carefully into those areas because they, they are my employer as well. Um, but he was actually really fantastic um, and was quite happy to talk on the record about, you know, Rupert and Lachlan and, his grandmother, um, you know, um, the, the late uh, uh, mother of Rupert who uh, had that wonderful place at Cruden Farm and he talked about the, the family holidays down there. But it was interesting at the end he, because um, he did say to me, uh, he said, oh, you will be careful with the Murdoch family stuff, won't you? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, yeah, don't worry. <laughs> it's not just you, it's me. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, you, it's just funny how some of these things things evolve. No. Um, when you're dealing with individuals, often there can be you know, personal issues. Um, you've got family and children straight away, um, you know, like you have with the Cannon Brooks, and there, there they are right in front of you. Um, sometimes they can be out of bounds or they can be extremely sensitive. So how do you go, how do you tackle this? Well, look, ch children is a really difficult issue. Um, and, you know, I'd be the same if I was being interviewed talking about my children. It's, it's a natural reaction of anybody to, to be defensive yeah. about that. Um, and there are occasions with, with subjects um, that I've interviewed over time, um, a couple that actually aren't in this book and I won't name, but um, they volunteered off the record in their interviews about issues they'd had with children. One had a, um, you know, disabled uh, child who actually, you know, was so difficult to care for that they had to put them into into, into care. And um, they talked very openly about it off the record, but they very clearly said, we don't want that in the article, and that's something you've got to respect. Sadly, there was another one that was very open in talking about his daughter's suicide and um, terrible story. But uh, he just said, you know, can you please respect our privacy and not putting that in the, in the article? Um, and, and on those occasions, you know, you have no choice. You have to respect that. Um, it's about my in integrity. People trust you to, to take you into that. But then there are other occasions where suddenly, um, you know, children come into it um, and they stay in it. And the one I will never forget is the car sales chief executive, Greg Roebuck, who's in the book. <laughs> now, that the interview was a bit like that Tony Perich one. Um, it was a... Uh, interview at Car Sales' office to mark the end of Greg's reign at Car Sales. And it was really just what I might call a, a run-of-the-mill, roll-your-arm-over exit interview, which tend to be pretty boring, I must say. <laughs> CEOs just sort of wax on about what they've done, what they haven't, and what they're doing next. Um, and I didn't know Greg especially well, I must say, but we knew each other. Um, in fact, I'd done an article a few years earlier that it, the... He sort of didn't particularly like so I think he was a little bit wary but when we sat down and started talking he just came out with this amazing story about his daughters um, and how he felt that um, being a full-time CEO he had somehow and I'm paraphrasing here sort of failed them a bit as a father 
And he told this great anecdote. One of his daughters said to him, um, you know, you spend more time mentoring your staff than you do me. And it was really very confronting for Greg. And it was incredible that he, that he shared that story. Um, yeah. And he said it was a real wake-up call. And I guess there was a great thematic in that too, and you'll see the way I wrote the, the piece. You know, I think there's so many CEOs or, or um, people running companies that have those same feelings all the time. Very rarely do they document it publicly. And the fact that Greg was willing to, to, to do that and talk about it was quite, quite amazing. And um, It's funny, the, the editor of the paper, when she saw the draft of the story, was, was so amazed. She actually said, do you think Greg would do a photo with his daughters? Now, that usually is absolutely taboo. Yep. Um, but to his great credit, I, I rang up actually just sort of almost just making sure I did my duty for the editor, <laughs> expecting the, the response. And Greg said, yeah, when you want to do it. I was, I was absolutely for And you can look back. Sadly, this book doesn't have photos, but if you look up the article when it appeared in the newspaper, it was this amazing photo taken at sunset um, of Greg and his daughters. And it was such a powerful image. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so you, unique because you just don't see that. It's very, very rare. So sometimes children can come into it, you know, in a very, in a very special way. Um, the other one that is very moving, um, which again I was slightly aware of beforehand, but again very wary of, of going into it, was with Barry Irvin, the bigger cheese boss, um, whose story is in the book, and he uh, had a, 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 you know, it was on the public record. He had a battle with cancer and and that was you know one of the the key topics of our interview obviously in his recovery which was amazing but he also has an autistic son um, and exploring with him in that interview about how you tell your autistic son who cannot communicate that you have cancer was um, a very difficult conversation and Barry is a very open person um, very uh, blunt and he just told me this is how I communicate with my son and they actually they press their foreheads together that's how they um, and it's it's a hangover from when his son was younger um, the, 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 the people who taught his son in the early days taught him to um, bend down in front of his father and his father would give him a kiss on the on the forehead and now um, in later years um, the the, uh, the the son is too tall to do that, so he um, basically leans forward and his forehead touches his father's forehead, which is very very moving. And the day when Barry told him about his cancer, um, he said that his son didn't register of course at all what, what he was saying but um, he had this habit of going and getting his shoes each time his father came home because he wanted to go for a walk so he went and got his shoes mm. as he did every other occasion and then put his forehead up to his dad and that touched his foreheads amazing story um, so yeah children are, are hard but to finish a long-winded answer to that question, will the other part that's always difficult to understand is relationships and relationship breakdowns. And yeah. um, several in, in this book have gone through uh, divorces, and um, some of them, you know, don't want that mentioned at all, which you totally respect. Some can sort of um, make light of it. Um, Leon Zwier, um had a you know great story about his. Uh, his ex-wife, who they, who he still stays on very good terms with, um, but uh, he had it was a, an amazing anecdote about um, it was this big deal was closing and he had to actually give a uh, a speech um, in in front of a, a big auditorium and um, that morning his wife was really furious with him um, and he didn't know why so he went and gave the speech. And he was um, reciting the date as he was talking on the stage, and he and he said in front of the whole crowd, um, "My wedding anniversary." <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, some can sort of make make light of it, um, but yeah, I think that's always marriage and relationships is always difficult. Um, the final one, which I was very powerful and confronting, was with Eloise Wiselitz, um, 
and it was in the media at the time that uh, that she and her husband Alex had uh, split and it was just in gossip columns but no one had confirmed anything and I did this big interview with her about her philanthropy but it was like the elephant in the room like do you ask her or don't you and um, and she was smart enough and her advisor, I think, had prepped her up well enough that she'd get asked. So she actually just jumped me and she just said straight out, she said, you know, Alex and I have separated. She said that on the record. Yeah. And, you know, sort of like, um, yeah, well, I'd sort of <laughs> heard that or I'd read about it. And, and then she proceeded to say, but, you know, we still love our children. Alex is a great dad. Um, we'll get through it, which, you know, was fantastic. So sometimes the elephant in the room, the subject can seize the moment rather than me having to, to drag it out of them. Um, we've started to get a few questions coming in. I might sort of integrate some of those in. The first one, um, we got an email actually before it all started. So um, David has uh, done his homework. He's referring to two of your books. So part one of the question is, uh, when you're talking about the deeds, you say the fight always comes down to money. Um, and that's where he's... Uh, in, They've engaged ABL and David Smorgan. And uh, what investment vehicles do you think provide equitable wealth transfer to the next generation? Um, you might want to throw the one back to us. Yeah. Yeah, well, I'm, uh, you can probably answer that question from a technical <laughs> sense, Will. But what I can say that I've in dealing with a lot of families, um, succession planning is, is just so fundamentally important, particularly when you have, um, you know, big shareholdings in public companies or you have, um, you know, a lot of property. Some of them do it differently. I think the Pratts are a great example and you can see by this book, this is evidence of it really. There's four of them interviewed here because Richard Pratt in a couple, in the years before he passed was very smart in splitting up his empire between his children. Yeah. So each of them had a, an operational business to, to take away and run. Um, but they all had a one-third share in the Fizzy Corporation, which is the family group that um, Gene Pratt, the matriarch, still chairs. So, and to be honest, that's made sure that it's been smooth sailing in the Pratt Empire since then. Um, you know, that was very clever. Same with the Beeson family and Carol Swartz is in this book. She's um, one of the, the Beeson, Mark Beeson's daughters um, and they had a liquidity event many years ago where they separated the empire. So, um, and, and that sort of has, has led to smooth sailing in that family as well. So, yeah, I think, but there are, and then if finally, you know, the David Fox example, um, Lindsay Fox has decided to keep that family all together and he still decides who gets what. Uh, as David says of his father, you know, he divvies up the pie. Yeah. Um, and I, I think it's on the public record, you know, that has led to some tensions in that family, but um, they are working through that. And I think a resolution is quite close. Um, but Lindsay chose to do it a very different way. Yeah. Um, yeah. And also part two of his question, which is actually referring to the James Packer book, The Price of Fortune. Um, you know that James Packer had a prenuptial agreement with Mariah, Mariah Carey. So what are your thoughts on these agreements or binding financial agreements? Um, well, from a professional point, point of view, I probably won't comment on the per personal side, but um, I have seen actually, I'm aware of a few families that actually mandate that their um, any family member who gets involved, not just in a marriage, but in a serious relationship, must have a prenup. Yeah. Um, and that's actually, you know, it's quite radical, I guess. But I know in one family, I'm certainly aware of it, which I won't name, but it's all about protecting the, the family fortune. Um, and it's actually been, it, it was a proposal was assembled by a, uh, an external firm that helped them with their succession, um, a la an ABL or a, or a um, David Smorgan. Uh, it was not those two individuals in this case, but the firm involved, you know, they actually said, we recommend you do this and the family accepted it. So I think it has a, has a place, but I am aware like in another family that, you know, I remember where that was mandated. Um, one of the children actually went rogue and said, don't do it because the premise of, of every relationship that is like, well, you know, what do we do when we split up type thing? It's not engendering a great uh, 
you would say, long-standing relationship when you start on that basis. Mm. So it can can be difficult, uh, but I can see the underlying rationale. Uh, Will's asking, which person interviewed in the Inner Sanctum did you find the most impressive and why? Mm. See, they're all impressive in different ways. Um, I think, first of all, they're all impressive because they are very open uh, and they go into areas that they they just traditionally do not. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a hard question because there's so many criteria you could benchmark that on. Um, I do, I, I guess I, you're very lucky with some of the people that you encounter in this. And um, I always remember the interview with Alan Myers um, because everybody knows the legend of Alan Myers and everybody knows that he never talks. So that was quite a stressful interview because I, I'm aware of his intellect um, and I just did not know how I would sort of manage here, if that's the right term. Yeah. Um, and I must say, in the first sort of 20 minutes, it was really hard work. Like, he doesn't do interviews. Um, he'd sort of been talked into it. Uh, he didn't know me. And, yeah, you really had to, you know, plough through. Um, but I think often I find with these sorts of people, um, once they realise you're not out to get them, they do take that as, as a, a, a compliment and B, a, a real uh, note of trust in you. And they tend to, to relax. And I remember, you know, an hour later in that interview, like, he couldn't shut that one up. <laughs> I kept on saying, can I just ask another question? He said, please, be my guest. <laughs> it was, but he, he, was, he was impressive. Like, um, you can see why he was able to, to do what he's done. And, and, um, and, but tough, though. You could see that in the early, in the first 20 minutes, you could see the, the tough side of Alan Myers, the, the one who puts up the wall, who does not let you through, like, uh, you know, very icy sort of, yeah. yeah, so, but they've all got sort of things beneath, I guess. Um, yeah, but anyway, yeah, impressive is a really difficult word to um, to sort of nail down because they all have different attributes as such. Uh, Bob's asking, how do you compare the quality of journalism today as compared to, say, 10, 15 years ago? There's also some structural things that have occurred in the industry as well. Um, yeah, look, it depends on, again, what your benchmark is. Um, I think there's still some real high-quality uh, journalism out there, um, particularly in the investigative space. Um, you know, that the, there are still some people that do that incredibly well. I think that but, but that's sort of less than it used to be, sadly, because it just isn't the resourcing and the time to do that. So the people that do do that in this game and in a world where, um, you know, everything's so much harder to, to get in terms of information, absolute credit to those people. Um, but, yeah, I think the craft has just been and become a lot more difficult with the online world, to be frank. Uh, I mean, I think about my, my morning here this morning, like I was um, I'm covering the Crown results today and probably no surprise given uh, the major shareholder there. And, uh, yeah, they put their results out. I have to write something for online before 10 o'clock. Um, I'm also covering the Crown inquiry that's going on at the moment, which you, you would be reading about in Sydney um, in relation to their issues with organised crime, whatever. So I had an ear on that all morning as well. Um, and then you had to have an ear on the Crown briefing for half an hour and then you have to write that up for online and have to write it for the newspaper. And that's just pretty standard sort of day now. So time is really difficult. Um, writing for online is, is unfortunately very low value add um, because you just don't have time. And, and time is of the essence. So, yeah, it's, it's a lot harder. And I guess back to, to my situation, just so lucky that the paper gives me the the bandwidth to be able to do these sorts of interviews with these sorts of people. And I should be very clear, like, as you would guess, these interviews don't fall off trucks. Some of them take, you know, a long time to get the trust of people to let you in. Um, and I 
always quote the Anthony Pratt example. You know, it was 18 months it took before I could um, get an interview with him um, because after his father passed, there was so much expectation, so much weight on his shoulders about, uh, you know, how would he carry the fortune forward? And, um, and he had a very difficult relationship with his father, so he was so wary of going on the record. Uh, yeah. And when he did, it was just an amazing interview, but so it took took a lot of time. So, yeah. Um, Carolyn's asking, what level of insecurity exists in these leaders that is important in driving their performance? Um, again, that depends on the context. I think in families, which there are quite a few in here, I do think there's an insecurity in the children, particularly, about following in their parents' footsteps mm. and basically not blowing up the fortune. Um, and I guess you see that, you know, most graphically with James Packer. Um, you know, the family fortune weighs on his mentality every waking hour, I think. His larger-than-life father, for all the good he did for him, probably did him a lot of harm, unfortunately, in terms of, um, mm. you know, James's fear of, of losing it essentially. Um, and again, that's a classic third generation scenario where you had Sir Frank and then you had Kerry and they always say the third generation blows it up. So James is always very, very wary of that. So yeah, I think in ch children, it's, um, there, there are always those sorts of emotions that, that drive them, but some do it incredibly well. And, um, you know, and I think about Carol Swartz, for example, you know, what she's done in her life she's been absolutely and you can read the articles quite it was a sort of point of tension between carol and i because i used to always call her the the daughter of uh, of mark beeson and she hated it yep. absolutely hated it and uh you can see that's the way that the story starts because um, she believes that she exists outside the beeson family orbit and she's made her own way which she has to a great credit um, now on the RBA board, just got appointed a company to, chairman of a public company today, actually. So, yeah, I mean, she dr is driven by her desire to do her own thing and to be outside the family. So with the public company ones, it's interesting. Andy Penn was a really fascinating interview. but um, And that was an interview that sort of, came after a real protracted period of, uh, of him being under the pump and under siege, really. Um, but I think, you know, what drives him is uh, he does believe that he can, you know, get the right outcome for the company. Um, he believes it's on the right trajectory. And um, we talked at length in that interview about how you deal with criticism. Do you read the newspapers? Do you take it personally? Um, and he was quite resolute on a lot of those issues um he's a guy who's very driven and you can like him or or dislike him and criticize him for how telstra's perform but um yeah he's determined to stay the course yes yeah. um, and that's it's a fire that burns within him so um marjorie uh, has first of all said congratulations on another great book what's your hardest yeah. and favorite of, of all time what was that, Sarah? What's both your hardest interview and what's your favourite of all time? Hmm. Um, I'll start with the latter one. Uh, the interview with Anthony Pratt, I'm probably, it's hard to single one out, but I'm very proud of that in the context that it was because now, you know, people see Anthony Pratt regularly in the press Um and, yeah, to his credit, he's become quite accomplished at being in the media and he's been managed very carefully. But back then, you know, that was the interview. Um, and it was, he, it was, I remember getting a note from one of my colleagues, um, and I'll mention him, Cameron Stewart, our Washington correspondent, who had known the Pratt family really well. And he, he said um, he was just very complimentary and he said that was just the ultimate blend of the weird and wonderful world of, of the Pratt's because <laughs> it is weird. And he knew that because he'd seen it, but um, yeah. So that was one I, I 
if, if you put it in the context of the time, I was incredibly proud of. The hardest one, um, I think the cake would have to go to James Packer in 2017. Um, just all the circumstances around that were bad, essentially, uh, except getting the interview. And if you remember at that stage, like, Packer had been in this crazy life of, um, you know, Mariah Carey, Israel, um, fighting with his sister, Crown staff arrested in China, uh, Hollywood, all that. Um, and no one knew anything about it because he, he had said absolutely nothing. And I had been hassling him for an interview for quite a while and just never heard anything or he'd just give you a polite, yeah, I'd like to catch up, but nothing happened. Um, and yeah, and then he um, amazingly changed his mind and um, he said, you have to come to Argentina because I'm not going anywhere, up, anywhere else. And he was a, not in a great way then. And, uh, yeah, had to fly over there overnight. And, um, you know, his mind came along as well, which is always an extra source of stress sometimes because you never know how uh, they're going to operate. But that was Mark R. Bibb, uh, the former federal politician. Um, and to Mark's great credit, he was actually helpful rather than a hinderer on that. Um, but I remember when I rocked up at the ranch, uh, I just had so low expectations of what I would get um, because I just did not know how some of these areas uh, he would um, traverse because they were just so difficult. Uh, and to his great credit, he really opened up on a, on a number of things. Um, but it was it was bloody hard because I remember the first hour of sitting down with him it was just nothing it was just you know going over things round in circles you know a cigarette in his mouth every five minutes and um yeah i mean he was nervous so in those situations it can be really hard to to, to coax them to sort of get to that next level but but we got there to his great credit um and the funniest thing about that was uh you know, I just I stayed there that night um, just for logistical reasons, and they have a, a guest sort of area of the place, so I was over at that. But it was really funny. I I had a really tight deadline, so I actually had to start writing as I was sitting there, and I sort of was thinking while I was sitting there, is he going to come in here and look over my shoulder and say, "What are you writing?" Um, thankfully, the next night I went into Buenos Aires and stayed in a hotel to finish the thing before I flew home. It was an incredibly tight deadline, but just all the circumstances of that were was really, really quite stressful. Um, but uh, and then fine to to finish that story. You know, then you produce the product, and you really wonder when you go into that sort of. Uh, depth and go through all those controversial issues led by the Mariah Carey thing that, of course, made global headlines that night when it yeah. came out. And I did not hear anything from James Packer that whole morning. And I remember I was kicking the footy with my son and uh, this email bobbed up sort of mid-morning. I was like, took a deep breath and opened it up. And thankfully, there was no swear word in the first line. And he just said, um, dear Damon, thanks for being fair. Best wishes, James. That's all it said. Mm -hmm. uh, and, yeah, I just felt amazing to have got that. And that's the thing about Packer. He's always, I think, if you asked him, he, he would say that he always thinks I've been fair. I've, okay, it's warts and all. It's good and bad, but I'm fair to him. And I think, unfortunately, he feels that the media has been very unfair to him during his life. Yeah. Um, Adam's asking, in the Inner Sanctum, you cover individuals that come from families of wealth and those that have created the wealth themselves. So have you noticed any differences between the two groups in your discussions with them? Yeah, I think when you interview a family patriarch or matriarch that's built their business, um, there's a freedom that they speak with, which is quite... Um, unique and special um, because at the end of the day, they they don't answer anybody but themselves, really. Um, and there's a great pride in the way that they talk. Um, and I do love those interviews because um, 
it's you know I use the Perich example, or there's a few others in there, where uh, you know they're incredibly proud of what they've cre created, and um, I know Tony Perich was incredibly proud of the, proud of the fact that his children followed in his footsteps. Um, I think when you are interviewing children, it really depends on the context of of you know where they are in their lives, how they're managing with siblings or parents or whatever, but. They don't speak with that freedom, I don't think. Yeah. Um, they are more careful. Um, I would say, you know, the interview with David Fox is an exception because he actually spoke with an incredible amount of freedom, probably more than he probably should have. Yeah. Um, and it's really funny with that one because his father and mother absolutely loved it. But from what I understand, it, you know, his uh, brothers were not so enamoured. <laughs> by him speaking so openly. So, yeah, the next generation, I think, are much more careful. Um, yeah, but it, again, it just depends on the context. And, and I look at the digs. Um, and in fact, while I interviewed John and Will together, um, I did subsequently do an interview with the three of them, with David as well. And you could see the dynamic that, um, you know, they always deferred to him, as you'd expect that they would, but when you just see the, the strong figure of, of the father with the sons, you know, they were um, more careful. Whereas in my interview with them by themselves, they had a bit more freedom. But you always sense they're looking over their shoulder, if that's yeah. the right terminology. So, yeah, it can be. But, yeah, look, it just, it just depends. Whereas you could argue with Anthony Pratt and, um, and James Packer, you know, their fathers were no longer around, but they still were huge shadows on them yeah. um yeah and it's uh the relationship between anthony pratt and his father was uh was very very difficult i think um and i think at the end of the day you know very sadly and this is in the story that um you know while james packer sort of got to see his dad before he passed you know i don't think anthony got the chance to talk to his dad at the end like like James did to his. And I think it's probably something that's eaten at him for many years. Yeah. Uh, David's asking, it's clear from several of your interviews that you've invested significant time building trust. Is that virtue of patience still alive and well in mainstream journalism? Um, oh, look, it's probably not, <laughs> to be honest. And that's not being unfair to anybody. I just think that um, the pressures and, and um, you know, the demands for to feed the beast, to put it that way, have just made it so much harder. Yeah. And I also think I was incredibly lucky to come through journalism in the era I did because um, when I la landed on the company's desk in 1999 at the AFR that I referred to earlier, like, I was given a round to cover, which was the building materials round. And that was the only thing I did for 12 months. Yeah. And I didn't have to go and I didn't have to file for online because there was no, no internet. I wrote for the newspaper each day for the company section of the newspaper following probably 10 companies. And I know relationships that I built in that time by going out and meeting people and having lunch with them and having coffees and going to briefings and whatever. I've still got those relationships today. Yep. I would, would challenge you to find any young journalist of my age as I was then that could have that luxury in this day and age. You know, the young journalist that comes in now is pulled from pillar to post by demands of editors, by demands of news. They have to write for online a number of times through a day, as well as for the next day's paper. They don't have the time to invest in those contacts that are just so important. Um, and at the end of the day, in journalism, you're only as good as your contacts, and that comes down to trust. So, yeah, yeah I do count myself very lucky to have come through in that era that I, that I was able to able to do that and very lucky now that I still comply that craft um, yeah um, Michael's art is asking only a few mentioned spirituality is this an area you canvassed or was it off the agenda no I often try to throw that question in um, it's a good observation 
yeah, religion can can be a, a really interesting topic if if you get the right moment and the right subject. And you know, I've come back to the Alan Myers situation. A very religious person, mm. and he was quite happy to explore explore that. Um, and then with Malcolm Broomhead, you know, I, I still didn't really know what religion he was, but um, yeah, having come through his cancer battle, he talks about a spiritual sort of uh, experience as such. But there are others that you raise the topic of religion and A, they might say, I don't want to go there. B, they say, I'm not religious. And um, Yeah, so it, it's a, you have to sort of go horses for courses a bit, but it is a very good question to throw in occasionally. The other question while we're talking about interesting questions that I find always gets a fascinating response and sometimes it completely stumps people is what is your greatest weakness? Mm. It's always a good one to have in your armoury um, because people don't expect it and it requires a level of um, yeah, looking at yourself that many of us never do uh, and particularly when you're sitting there with a tape recorder going, it's quite confronting. And some of the responses over the years have been quite amazing to that question and quite enlightening as well about what people think of themselves, how they perceive it how they perceive the, the way they're perceived. Um, yeah. And sometimes it can bring, you know, the strongest characters uh, slightly to their knees metaphorically. Uh, I remember with David Crawford, I mean, he, when I asked him that question, he just said, oh, I've got so many, David, and I don't know where to start. <laughs> you know, which a towering figure of corporate Australia as David was, like it's a, that's a big, um, you know, testament to him to be so open. Is there anyone you say you've learnt your craft from? Yeah, I've um, been working in these sort of in these high quality newspapers. I've been incredibly lucky um, to work with some of the best journalists around. And one I'll single out who a lot of people would know, uh, I'm sure follow her, is Pamela Williams, who um, has written a number of books about politics and She's still with the Financial Review today. Um, but in, in 2006, when I was, um, you know, still making my way, um, we were thrown together to do a big James Packer interview, Speak of the Devil, the first one since his father's passing, like that Anthony Pratt parallel. And, but I was very much the junior um, so Pam was like the guru, but because I developed a relationship with James, the editor said, Dan, can you do it with Pam? So, um, and I always remember, um, I'll, I'll do this in reverse order. We did the interview and um, Pam said, can you transcribe the tapes for me? And of course I had to say, yep, no worries. <laughs> I was the junior party. And I sent her the, the transcripts as I'd done them. And she rang me up within minutes. I was like, oh, bloody hell, what have I stuffed up? And she said, Where, where's the rest of it? I said, what do you mean? I've just sent you all the stuff. She said, no, where, where is it all? I said, well, what do you mean? And she said, you've cut out all the ums and ahs and off the records and um, colour and movement and all I'd done is, is just give her a transcript of exactly what he said on stuff that I thought was newsworthy. <laughs> Yeah. I'd because I was a news journalist at the time, I had subconsciously edited out all these wonderful reflections and colour and sidelines and off the records and whatever. And it really taught me that, um, yeah, your best lines can actually be uh, nothing to do with news, nothing to do with the here and now. And it's funny that I remember the first piece I wrote after that interview was an interview with someone I now know very well, Graham Burke from Village Roadshow, who, um, you know, has a, been a long time CEO there. And when I interviewed Graham a week after Pam gave me that advice, I, I said to him, and Village Roadshow had been through the ringer, and I said, are you going to say sorry to the shareholders? And he looked at me and he said, God damn, and that's like John Howard and the Aborigines. And if you look up that story, that's the way I led the story, <laughs> which I don't think Graham's ever forgiven me for. 
jokingly, but in my pre Pam Williams mindset, I just would have cut that out. But it was such a powerful statement. Um, and it says so much about, you know, that's just Graham. Uh, it was a real highlight of his of his character. But the, the final um, finish to that Packers thing with Pam, um, so she taught me that, but also she taught me how to um, calm people. And that day that we did that interview, James was completely wound up, totally stressed, and um, it was going to be the front cover of the AFR magazine. Mm. And the photographer, uh, you know, spent 40 minutes setting up in his office and whatever. And he walked in the room, you know, looking like he was going to thump someone. And he looked at the photographer and said, you got one shot. <laughs> Take it. You got one shot. Yeah. And he just, the photographer, who was very good, just went into absolute meltdown. And at that moment, Pam said, which was so smart, she walked over to James and said, stop, I want a photo first. And she actually put her arms around him and said, I'm here with him, let's get a photo. And James just like completely, what the? And she said, no, no, I want a photo. Can you do us first? And he was just completely put at ease. Yeah. And, and yeah, and the photographer sort of went over, took a few photos of him and she sort of kept him talking and then, yeah, we ended up getting a few minutes at least, which in Packer land is like an hour. Yeah. But it was just so classy how she did that and put him at ease. So, yeah, I guess I've learned over time. That I've never actually put my arms around anybody. <laughs> but, um, yeah, you you learn that sometimes you just have to be patient and you, you can't take no for an answer and you've just got to, you know, do your time. I mean, it's funny, I was talking to the daughter of a famous patriarch just the other day for something I'm doing at the moment, and um, she just burst into tears on the phone. Uh, and I was just out of stress. And, um, and I just kept her on the line and, yeah, just sort of tried to comfort her. And five minutes later, she was like, yep, okay, so what's your questions? <laughs> and off we went. So yeah, you just learn that sometimes people can be can be incredibly confronting to be interviewed by a journalist, particularly if it's personal, um, and you've just got to, you know, stay the course. I mean, you've specialised in people in private business and those that you've had a and those that have had a lot of success. So how have you got these people to be so open with you? Um, well, it's just it comes back to trust. That's the absolute fundamental premise um, getting in the door is just all about trust and again it comes back to what i said earlier about a, a network i think you some of these networks are not large and you get a name that you can be trusted people are you know prepared to to bank on you i guess if that's the right term sometimes it also um, requires intermediaries if i can put term it that way where you, they vouch for you. And there's a few in this book that I only got the interview because an intermediary, um, you know, gave me the entree. But, you know, once you're through that door, you're on your own. The intermediary is not there to, to help. Um, so, yeah, it's very much about, it's, it just comes down to trust. I don't know, I can't really answer it any more clearly. Um, yeah, and, and then they have have to have the trust that when you're talking to them that they can go into areas where they're going to be treated fairly and fairly, fairly most of all, i.e. the Packery and Pratt example, but also respectfully. Um, and I think, you know, particularly some of the personal stories in here, they have to be told with great care. And I've, you know, one of the most moving pieces I've ever had to do in that book is the Cowan family story. We have, you know, a, a father and husband taken from the world at such a young age, really. Um, yes, they had wealth and, uh, yes, he was the son of the Governor-General and whatever, but they're still human beings. And um, that was a very hard interview to do. And the responsibility that you felt when you were writing that, because uh, there were children involved as well and, 
yeah, it is a responsibility to tell those sorts of stories. Um, and, you know, I should have said earlier, I think someone asked what one I was most proud of. You know, I put that one up there as well because because it was so personal. Um, and it touched so many people, I think, reading that because we all related to it. Yep. We are nearly up to an hour and we have a few out questions, which we'll get back to those people individually. But look, thank you, Damon. Just before we wrap up, have you got any final words you'd like to pass on to the audience? No, I'll just thank everybody for, um, for your interest. I'm really, uh, yeah, proud of the fact that... Um, you know, th this has got some interest for you. I, I guess what I've tried to do in these past 10 years is um, something a little bit different. And, uh, yeah, I hope people really enjoy reading these stories um, because I've certainly enjoyed telling them, that's for sure. And as I said, I, I've, it's a responsibility with, with a lot of this stuff about, you know, how you tell some of these human stories. And I hope I've done the subjects justice and I hope you as readers enjoy that. Well, look, it's a fantastic book and well done. A great follow-up to The Price of Fortune um, with James Packer. Uh, thank you very much for your time. Um, we've had a great turnout and we really appreci appreciate everyone um, attending. So thanks, Damon, and uh, good luck on writing up Crown today. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thanks, Will. Bye-bye. Okay.